Thank you very much, Fernando, for this very kind introduction, which uh, clearly shows that uh, we are friends uh, for, for many, many years ago indeed. So for me, it's a big pleasure always to come here to Toledo. It's uh, so very good friends, people here uh, for many years as well. Um, today is uh, related, uh, my presentation is related uh, with organic photovoltaics from a chemical viewpoint. But before starting, I would like to thank to the organizer, not, not, not only to Fernando for this kind introduction, but also the, the organizer for this kind invitation to participate in this meeting. Actually, it's a meeting which is related with a very, many, many topics within this uh, general framework, which is energy and environment. And therefore, because of that, I decided to, to introduce uh, to the topic. So I decided to, 
in my first part of my presentation to give some uh, general overview on, the, on organic photovoltaics, always with this perspective, perspective, perspective okay, with this focus, which is a chemical approach. <laughs> so, uh, so this could be what is the basic idea, how to get devices, which is certainly the most remarkable, but also that uh, just behind all these devices are chemicals, are uh, chemical compounds that are, have to be prepared, and it's uh, not an easy task sometimes. And this is uh, what you can see here is uh, many people could consider like a war in, in jail, in the prison, because of the crisis or because of, uh, you know, but it's certainly not the case. It, the, the meaning is that uh, the, the carbon nanostructures spread all over the world. Okay, so that is the basic idea. So, just, just before starting, um, th there are two molecules in, in, in chemistry which are really uh, very bad uh, marketing about them. One of them is CO2 and the other one is cholesterol. But both are really needed and uh, certainly uh, I like both, both molecules. But uh, in particular because um, uh, today, probably in this, meet in this, in this uh, meeting, uh, in this Congress, many people was talking about uh, the, the fossil fuels not in a very good and in a very positive manner. However, we have to say that uh, fossil fuels have been always ready with progress. Okay? Is the, is the problem is the, the, the amount of SO2 which is produced. And of course, this started with the Industrial Revolution two centuries ago. But if you have a look to some uh, aspects, the, here are presented only uh, some of them, but the number of cars in Spain just at the very beginning of last century was only three. Probably uh, I could include the names of the people as the owners of this car, but uh, just uh, over one century later, just in Spain over 31 million cars. This is important, and also here there are other numbers which are also critical. Today, a few months ago, we celebrated the, the boy uh, was born uh, with the, I don't know certainly how they are able to count all babies born in on the world, but uh, it's around 7,000 million inhabitants in our planet. And uh, it is expected just in around 40 years later to be close to 10,000 million. Of course, it depends on the poli uh, policy uh, in China, mostly in China, but, uh, and India as well. So, uh, just looking at this number, what is clear is that uh, energy is for sure the, the most important uh, challenge facing the, the human being. So, and that is one of the reasons because these kind of meetings are important. Uh, also, because uh, scientists have to put the, the eye on this uh, specific topic, as, as I will show you just later on. And if we have a problem with the energy, for sure that uh, uh, we have to look for uh, alternatives. Uh, in, and in this particular case, the sun is, could be considered a giant nuclear fusion reactor. This, this is quite important because, as has been already mentioned before, but the energy received from sun exceeds in, in many, many uh, surpasses uh, that consumed on the planet in one year. So pro in, just in, in one hour. So this is uh, the reason because this could be one of the possibilities. And, uh, and for sure it's, uh, the sun is, is, as is mentioned here, the most powerful source of energy and uh, which could contribute to, to this big problem. And, uh, Probably you know about this. If not, I think it's important that for the audience to know about perhaps the most important project uh, which has been uh, launched by the uh, European uh, Union in this, in this regard affecting Europe, Middle East, and North Africa. This is the, one of the map. So if you go to internet and enter in uh, DesertTech, which is a global solution based on harnessing sustainable power, for power from those places where renewable uh, uh, sources of energy are abundant. 
And in this particular case, it is focused on solar power plants and also eolic power. These are the, the important topics. And uh, in principle, the basic idea for this big project was to provide 15% of the energy in Europe in uh, around 40 years or so. This is a, a brilliant idea. It was many countries involved in this project and uh, many around 30 companies or so, including some uh, Spanish companies like Avengoa and so on. However, recently, just by reading the, the newspapers uh, uh, come out in Germany or France or UK, you can see that uh, Deutsche Tech is uh, on the ropes in the sense that uh, competitors and opponents threaten uh, the energy plan. So that means that uh, the future is not so clear as uh, just uh, uh, one year ago or two years ago. So uh, this could be just a dream and only uh, maybe a few uh, power, solar power plants or eolic plants could be uh, produced just in these areas, but not for sure not, not the whole plant. So this is uh, just the motivation of my presentation, which is the importance of energy and which is the role that chemistry can play in this game. Well, it is important uh, to know about the solar energy it has already been mentioned before that one hour of, of uh, sun energy would provide if we were able to, to get the 100% of uh, efficiency of, for the conversion, uh, but uh, just to, to supply all the energy in the planet. But now, if we want to, to do this, uh, we have to produce the, the photovoltaic devices, and it has been already mentioned before, uh, how is the role of inorganic and also uh, silicon uh, applications. It's uh, just the commercial uh, devices based on silicon is around 15-16% efficiency, which is with uh, polycrystalline or amorphous silicon. So on the other side is uh, what we could say the organic uh, approach or hybrid approach uh, or red set type. Of course that this is not to compete or to substitute the silicon cells. On the contrary, it's just to complement. Okay, so Emilio mentioned, I think, about the, the idea of, uh, for computers. I mean, typically indoors, indoors applications mostly. But uh, if we are thinking about this kind of devices, then we have to, as I mentioned before, from a chemical viewpoint, what we need are those organic materials for the preparation of these uh, devices. And that is uh, what I would like to show you today. Uh, not, I, I will not talk uh, about all of them. Uh, in, uh, people like uh, Pilar and people from other groups have been related with the uh, red cell type solar cells and also Emilio mentioned uh, specifically on small organic molecules, which basically could be also considered all organic. But this all organic, I'm, I mostly refer to plastic or polymeric solar cells, okay? And this is the, what I would like to focus today on this kind of materials for the preparation of these devices. Well, just, uh, uh, this is an overview of the most important, not, not all of them, but maybe the most important uh, um, renewable energies, mostly biomass, uh, hydroelectric energy, for, for sure eolic energy, particularly in Spain has been also very important, and geothermal energy and solar energy. And in this particular case, uh, what I would like to focus specifically is what can a molecule like uh, fullerene do for, for the, uh, the solar energy uh, uh, production. So, with this in mind, uh, my, my presentation for today would be, uh, first of all, to go to some uh, an, very brief overview on some basic concepts on photovoltaics, and then to, to mention why to use uh, some uh, fullerenes, and in particular the, the well-known PCBM, has been already mentioned before. Some results from our group, mostly the DPMs and uh, timers, and then perhaps some new avenues in photovoltaic cells. I, will, I would like to mention specifically endohedral fullerenes and maybe a, a little bit uh, carbon, which is the, the hopes for carbon nanotubes as well. And then I would like to draw you some conclusions of my presentation. 
So uh, related with uh, the, this is the, the well-known molecule here in Toledo. There is a, a group working very uh, uh, skillfully and, and, and nicely also with fullerenes, which is uh, uh, Fernando Langa and also his group. And uh, here, this, the diameter for this molecule is uh, roughly one nanometer. This is the van der Waals radius. And it uh, could be considered that uh, the, the, the single molecule for, for nanoscience. And these are the, the differences in, in size. So, but uh, if, we, if we are looking for applications for furorines, certainly it's a difficult question. <laughs> And uh, I would say that there is no, uh, up almost 30, 30 years later from the discovery of fullerenes, there is not the real application today. A small and uh, exotic application could be. But in any case, um, if we had to answer this question, which are the most realistic application for fullerenes, no doubt that uh, photovoltaic could be the answer. So let's go to this. Uh, maybe the, what we had to do is, is just to have a look to the photosynthetic process. And uh, I, I needn't to explain you about it. But uh, look at, again, the, the CO2 molecule, which is absolutely necessary. So this is, uh, according to Primo Levi, in the periodic table book, he mentioned about the CO2 as the gas of life. Actually, this is the, 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 the CO2 is the, the natural gas supply in the carbon for the preparation of carbohydrates. Uh, so if we, have, uh, if we have a look very carefully to the photosynthetic process, immediately we would realize that uh, within a matrix, uh, um, a proteic matrix, uh, we can see that there is occurring a, a sequence of energy and electron transfer processes typically involving, uh, uh, these are chlorophylls, which are uh, porphyrin derivatives, and also ubiquinones, which are mostly paramensoquinone derivatives. So this is what mo Mother Nature used for the photosynthetic process. Maybe by mimicking this process, perhaps we are able to harvest solar energy to be able to transform it into maybe electricity, and perhaps we have the opportunity to, to, to also to help or to join to those energies which uh, are able to solve some of the problems, in particular the main problem of lack of energy. Because having energy may be other problems like uh, water quality, food needs, uh, environmental pollution and so on could be solved. Okay? So this is the basic idea. So if we try to mimic the photosynthetic process, for sure that photoinduced electron transfer process have a great significance in nature since they govern photosynthesis in plants and bacteria. And this process, which occurs at the reaction centers, uh, typically occurs with a 100% quantum yield, thus enabling the transformation of sunlight into chemical energy. And, uh, well, what we have been doing in the last uh, maybe two decades or so, uh, the, the preparation of the so-called artificial photosynthetic systems, they are mostly uh, uh, formed by a, an electron donor molecule or moiety together uh, covalently or non-covalently connected to the electron acceptor unit. And light irradiation promotes the electron transfer from the donor to the acceptor, giving rise to the, to the charge separated state or the formation of the radical ion pair. And this is uh, what we want to mimic, just to learn about this, this natural process. And this is a molecule which I like very much. It was reported maybe 20 years ago by Kurek. He's a German researcher. It's a beautiful molecule because uh, you can see that the, those molecules uh, used by Mother Nature, which is the porphyrin, this is a free porphyrin, is covalently connected to the paramensoquinone. So light irradiation very nicely moves uh, uh, one electron, transfer one electron from the donor to the acceptor. And uh, basically the, the, the scheme followed by this uh, photoinduced process is shown in the, in the screen. And, and you see that uh, light irradiation promotes one electron, excitation means that one electron is promoted to the excited state. And of course, this excited state can go back to the ground state or alternatively undergo an electron transfer process to form the radical ion pair, which eventually will go back to the ground state. 
this is what uh, the, uh, what we have to consider in this photophysical um, uh, scenario. So uh, the question is why to use uh, why to use fullerenes for this one? Uh, well, th there are some features for this beautiful molecule which are particularly remarkable or, or of interest for for photovoltaic applications. The first one is the small reorganization energy of the molecule. We can discuss later if you like about the meaning of this low reorganization energy. But high electron affinity, relatively, uh, C60 is a relatively good electron acceptor molecule. The capacity to transport charge, which is uh, also the stability, chemical and ambient stability of this molecule. And uh, also, which is remarkable, is the spherical symmetry. All these parameters are very, uh, are, I would say, essential for the photovoltaic uh, application. And of course, then uh, this uh, molecule can be also prepared in multigram amounts without any problem. So, here is a, a basic scheme. It has been already shown in previous lectures, uh, but uh, what I would like to, to tell you is to show you here is how simple it is to prepare these, these cells. Okay, it's, uh, you need a substrate which is typically glass or, or, or plastic and you need uh, the anode which is transparent as was already mentioned before. This is tin oxide dope with uh, indium uh, and uh, in this uh, ITO and this is a transparent electrode. The, the cathode is here typically is a metal aluminum of calcium or, or magnesium but uh, then you have the active phase which is the mixture of donor and acceptor and uh, a different evolution has been uh, used, as I will mention uh, uh, later. Uh, but here, what you have in between the electrodes and the active, active phase is just a, a polymer or this uh, ionic interface, typically lithium fluoride, which in, in general allows a better contact, a better uh, transport uh, ch uh, of charges to, to the electrodes. Uh, well, uh, one, uh, something which uh, people don't, P dot PSS is, is not transparent. However, after uh, doping, it becomes transparent. So it is, uh, for our purposes, is, is quite good. And also, initially, PM heterojunction, I mean, the donor and acceptor are together, but uh, the interaction is all, only occurring in the interface. So this is important because for many years from the, it, it was uh, handled the concept, the so-called bulk, bulk heterojunction. This was a concept that was developed in the first European project, which was funded by the European Union. Ten groups at that time it was middle 90s, and uh, our group was already uh, uh, participating in this project. So it is almost 20 years uh, we started uh, with, with, related with these topics. This is a tremendous increase of the interface area in between donor and acceptor. This is intertwining donor and acceptor uh, species. And therefore, in principle, it should uh, dramatically increase the interaction at, at, the, at the interface. This could be considered the, the, the fullerene and the polymer in between. So, uh, but even what is much more remar remarkable for these uh, uh, polymer uh, uh, devices uh, is that these materials can be processed from solution. And this should have a very, very or I would say many advantages when you compare with uh, typical silicon devices. So, in any case, once we have produced our photovoltaic devices, there are always, let's say, if, if you can split uh, five different uh, um, uh, situations or, or events that happen. The first one is the absorption of the incident light. Of course, you need the transparent uh, electrode and also the, the, the substrate. This is the absorption of incident light is followed by the formation of the exciton. Mostly the exciton is basically the, the positive, I mean the elect electron and the hole, which are all together. Think about these uh, positive and negative charges. So in principle they are very close to each other. And this is one of the main problems, just to keep separated the positive and negative charge. So the, the, the exciton has to diffuse uh, along the, the, the cell, uh, and when the exciton reaches the, the other phase, I think that is the situation with a, a voltage appear, that is a, and is the 
real situation to produce the charge separation. And once the charges have been separated, migration of the electrodes have to occur later. I will not go into detail about this, has been already mentioned, but the efficiency depends of uh, uh, certain photovoltaic parameters like uh, open circuit voltage or uh, circuit, uh, short circuit uh, uh, density of current. Okay, this is a very naive presentation of uh, what is how the, the organic devices, solar cell, uh, is working. These are the electrodes, here is the fullerene, this is in red is the polymer, and uh, when the photon is coming, the photon has to approach uh, and it generates the, this is the exciton, and the exciton in close proximity to the, to the other place is moving, is produced the separation, the charge separation, and the movement of the charges. So if we go one step further, further and we want to explain this situation, more in detail and considering the electronic properties, have a look to this one. You have the, the electrodes, this is the donor, that means the HOMO is uh, higher in energy. This is the acceptor, that means the LUMO is lower in energy. And uh, just when light irradiation, what is doing is just to promoting one electron from the HOMO to the LUMO, and this is the exciton. The exciton has to move to the interface, and in, just in the interface, the charge separation occurs. Okay, because why a positive and negative charges has, has to be separated? They like to be close one to each other. So you need to apply a potential, and this potential is occurring only at the interface. Okay, so this is, this is a big difference with the semiconducting inorganic materials. So, and another important aspect is just to consider the energy levels. This is the typical poly 3 xyl thiophene. This is a paraffinylene vinylene derivative. Was these two polymers have been uh, by far the most uh, typical polymers used for photovoltaic devices, and PCBM has been the, the best studied molecule as well. But uh, if you, we want to prepare an ideal donor polymer, we have to control the homo and lumo levels, and uh, this would be that which could be considered ideal simply because the difference in the gap energy between the HOMO and LUMO is around 1.5 electron volts. So this is considered a low band gap polymer or 1.5 or lower, typically. So, and this uh, then, uh, if you, parameter you have to control is the HOMO of the, of the polymer and the LUMO of the acceptor. And this is the, the which is controlling the BOC of the, of the photovoltaic device. And look at this, is, uh, if you have this level too high, you are, you are losing a big uh, quantity of energy. It has been proved that 0.3 electron volts is good enough for the driving force to promote the electron transfer from the donor to the acceptor. I will not go more into detail on this. And I would like to show you now, now some of the molecules we prepare in our lab. One of them was the, the DPM. It, this molecule can be prepared just in three synthetic steps, very, very uh, nice uh, gels, and uh, what is remarkable is that the molecule can be prepared in multigram scale. Actually, at the beginning, uh, when we prepared this molecule and was reported now uh, uh, several years ago, was one of the most relevant values at that time. Actually, at that time, the, the performance of the molecule was so good that uh, we decided to call DPM because it was the maravilla. It was, you know, so actually at the end is diphenyl methanofluorine, but uh, we are not sure what it was before. Um, also, we applied to C70, and in C70 you can have also the same molecule, but it was reported uh, later on. So, just by mixing the polymer like poly 3 xyl thiophene with the DPM12, uh, the, molecule, the, the device was prepared, and here you have some of the data. There are many parameters should be considered at the same time. In particular, the stoichiometry is one of those parameters which are essential. Here you see the polymer and the, the fluorine derivative. Of course, this study was carried out by comparing with uh, PCBM. And you can see that by using this stoichiometry, uh, probably because of the length of the alkyl chain, which is too long, too long. Uh, you can see that here the efficiency resulted to be not comparable, really not comparable. Our molecule 
performance was not very good. But if you decrease significantly the content of uh, DPM-12, and now the stoichiometry is 1.2, you can see that the efficiency of, of our, device, our device with the molecule was uh, at the same level than, than the PCBM. So in principle, the performance should be more or less the same. Have a look to this, and you can see here that the BOC resulted to be around 100 millivolts higher in our molecule than in the PCBM. This is remarkable because, as I mentioned before, the BOC depends on the HOMO of the, of the polymer and the LUMO of the acceptor. And the LUMO is closely related with the reduction potential value. And if you, if you measure the reduction potential value for PCBM and for DPM-12, it's exactly the same. So this was uh, one of the, of the uh, I would say, uh, problems we had at the beginning to solve just to explain this uh, difference in, in BOC. You can see here that uh, just by modifying the alkyl change, as uh, Emilio mentioned before, mentioned before uh, you can see that uh, this allowed to, to decrease because the content of uh, fullerene now is higher because of the shorter alkyl change, and now the stoichiometry can be one-to-one. -one. And if you use this stoichiometry, you can see that the DPM resulted to be a little bit lower. But uh, again, uh, the BOC was higher in this molecule, despite the reduction potential values are exactly the same. This was an intriguing situation. So, and uh, if you have a look here, you can see that in this particular case, while the performance was a little bit higher, uh, just by reducing the alkyl chain. So this is the external quantum efficiency, and you see that the performance of DPM is quite quite similar to that of PCBM. So, in principle, the molecule was quite good. Uh, just to explain this uh, BOC difference in between two molecules, this was uh, now, in, in, the last very, in the very last years, uh, it has been explained much more carefully. But at that time, I had to say that uh, we were discussing uh, with Emilio and also people from other labs, like Hem Bolling in Valencia and Juan Bisquer in Castellón, and uh, this was really uh, a problem that uh, was not so simple to look for the solution. But uh, I know that uh, what uh, Emilio mentioned before, that you have to carry out the measurement on the device, not on the starting materials. But just to show that the, the differences in between the PCBM and, and DPM6, for instance, you can see that immediately just by, by annealing of this molecule, just by putting 150 degrees for one hour, you, you immediately recognize the formation of crystals in the PCPM, and this is not the case when you have the DPM-6. So no crystals, probably because of the alkyl chain. You know that the presence of long alkyl chains reduce the trend to crystallinity. So this was an important difference, but uh, what it was also clear is that because of the higher electron mobility of DPM-6 when you compare it with 12, because of the reduced of the alkyl change, the content of fullerene is also reduced to one to one. So this is important uh, uh, improvement as well in the device performance of these systems. But the real solution was found in this paper in collaboration with Juan Bisquer, that eventually by using impedance spectroscopy, as it was also uh, uh, mentioned before, the, 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 this is, uh, the density of states, the comparison of the two molecules, and you can see immediately that this, the population in the DPM6 is higher than that found for the PCBM. So this is the, the energy, uh, the uh, Fermi energy level for the, for the states, the density of states is here higher, remarkable higher, and yes, when you compare these two systems, that having the higher uh, number of density of, of states, which is clearly observed for the DPM6, this is, uh, will produce a higher photovoltage in the bulk heterojunction. And this is the, the, the real explanation, because remember what I mentioned before, both molecules have exactly the same reduction potential value by electrochemical measurements. So how to explain then the BOC, which is, uh, which is depending on the, on the LUMO level. So the real explanation is found in the different uh, um, 
density of states for the two molecules. Okay, so another one step further in the, in the synthesis of this material was these molecules which were uh, prepared uh, in, in our group with uh, Juan Luis Delgado was also engaged and also Carmen Atienza, the synthesis of these, of these dimers. Uh, of course, this is C70. C70 because the, you can see here that we prepare homo and hetero dimers. And this is C60 and the absorbance for the C70 is significantly higher. This can be observed much better here in which the absorbance of, the, of, the, of this dimer having two C70 uh, units resulted to be significantly higher to that, to that found for the C60. So we decided to carry out the study with these dimers. It was a little bit disappointed because despite the very good absorbance of, of, PC, uh, of the uh, PCB, uh, sorry, uh, the dimer, C70 dimer, you can see here that external quantum efficiency was in very good agreement with that found for the absorbance of these systems. This is with the poly 3 thiophene. But when you have a look to the efficiencies, resulted to be uh, just uh, around, in the, in the, around 1% uh, in, for these systems, in particular for the C70, uh, resulted to be uh, relatively was uh, um, not, not uh, those expected results. Um, and here you can see the, the other photovoltaic uh, parameters. The idea was quite good, and this is, in our hands, probably one of the problems in these systems could be solubility. Because just by taking this idea, this was come out in 2009, and just uh, let me show you that since then, other timers were published in literature. And for instance, last year, it was appeared this, uh, this paper uh, by using these uh, PCBM timers or even trimers. And you can see that for these systems, when you compare the, the, for, the, for the dimer, this is the BP, the dimer resulted to be significantly higher than that found for the pristine PCPM. So the idea of having more than one unit was, in principle, quite good. Maybe the, the presence of these alkyl chains are favoring the solubility and admissibility with the polymer because there are many concepts you have to deal with, all, all of them at the same time. So, <clears throat> just let me show you which is the, the current situation today on these cells. And uh, these two polymers have been the, the most widely used polymer for sure along the, the, the history of, the, of these polymer uh, uh, photovoltaic devices. More recently, this, uh, this is one of the former examples, the so-called up for green was prepared by Matt Sanderson in, in Sweden. And uh, basically, this is one example of those polymers that have been currently, uh, under, are currently under study in which you have a donor and, and a septor unit. If you have a, a poly, and this is a, a copolymer, you have a, a proper donor species, that means that you are increasing the homo, you have a very good electron acceptor unit, you are decreasing the LUMO level. So the homo-LUMO gap is becoming uh, lower and lower. And that means that the absorption of the polymer is shifting to the infrared region, which is, that means that you are, uh, you are moving along the, 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 the whole visible region of the, of the sun spectrum. So, and um, looking at the, at the C60 derivatives, well, this is the PCBM derivative, this uh, uh, DPM, this was improved to around three but the performance is quite similar to the PCBM and other derivatives. For sure that there are today uh, better examples than this one, but this was the former idea. So today, maybe if you, are, uh, if you want to have a look to the records, um, I would say that this is uh, the PCBM with C70 because of the increase of the absorbance. And here is one of the examples, PTB7, in which you have, again, a donor and a septor unit. This is a donor and a septor unit, and this is the low back polymer. So this is what's happening reported. I, it, uh, I mean, it's 7.4%. Uh, and just by modifying a little bit uh, in this, uh, well, this is, this is it's funny to say, PBDTTT, 
and so on. But uh, this is a poly uh, vessel, the uh, uh, thionyl, and this is thionyl thiophene. So that is the meaning of all this one. But just by modifying the alkoxy group by the thionyl groups, you can improve the efficiency over 1%. So this is interesting. This is a carbonyl group, this is a carbonyl group, and thionyl. That is the meaning of these systems. So today, even though it has not been properly reported in, in a paper, but it has been claimed by, by different companies, for instance, this is one of, the, of them, maybe Heliatech has reported to be able to, to form photovoltaic devices surpassing or approaching to 11%, 12 the, the same one? Well, this is in internet. Actually, it has not been published in a paper. So if you have a look to, it's uh, 12, but it's okay. Um, well, still, with this, uh, the major drawbacks uh, for organic solar cells, we could say that you can see here what has been the evolution of this one. So uh, it was, uh, the 5% the, the was reached at around 2007. So when we reported uh, close to 3% at 2005, was quite good indeed at that time. So, but uh, these are the, the major drawbacks. Short lifetime for the radical ion pairs, the low mobility of the charge carriers. This is, these are open questions so far. The low control of the nanomorphology. This is a very important issue of donor receptor composites and uh, moderate absorption of the incident sunlight. Perhaps this, this topic has already has been properly addressed now with the most recent low band gap polymer. So I would say that this has been very nicely addressed at this point. But still, there are some challenges in front of us as in maybe to investigate aspects related with the fabrication and the stability of the devices. Typically, people don't speak about, this, about these points. Understanding, a better understanding of the photophysical processes underlying the photovoltaic response. And also, important issues, implementation of new materials, okay? And actually, as it was mentioned before, uh, the presence of perovskite. Uh, has been a very, very good advance. Everybody is talking about the, this paper has been reported just a few months ago. And uh, so that means that the real advances, of course, with really new materials. So new material, this is, uh, I would like to focus on implementation of new materials as one of the main, of the main uh, ways to, for improving uh, efficiencies. And in this regard, let me show you uh, a, a kind of material which are very close related with the fullerenes, actually they are called uh, endohedral fullerenes. Typically these, these compounds, which are beautiful by the way, is, uh, with, uh, these are cages, carbon cages, uh, incarcerating atoms, clusters, or maybe a small molecules like water, hydrogen, and so on. So people could, be con could consider that these are rare species, but after C60 and C70, uh, the scandium nitride endohedral fullerene is the higher or the most abundant fullerene. Actually, with gadolinium inside, uh, for instance, uh, for, for image purposes, it are preparing kilograms amounts. So, uh, you, this is uh, all those color uh, elements means that they have been already introduced, have been incarcerated within this, the, the, the carbon cage by following, of course, different strategies, which I will not mention just today. But let me show you that this, for instance, the lanthanum C82, lanthanum 2 C80, or scandium nitride C80, these are endohedral materials which are completely different to the C60. Actually, I, had, I have had some discussion with referees when you submit a paper with this, and, and sometimes uh, a non-expert, not very expert referee on this material, they, uh, in, in his or her comments, they say oh, another example with fullerene, and you complain eagerly just to say that this, uh, that means that this referee know nothing about this material, simply because, for instance, scandium nitride should be considered something, something like this. Scandium nitride means that you have six positive charges in this complex. Actually, scandium nitride, it does not exist because you need another uh, six negative charges, so you need a counter ion. And in this particular case, these negative charges are spread on the uh, fullerene surface. 
So these are really new materials, and, and a fullerene having six electrons on the surface, for sure that the, the chemical properties and chemical reactivity should be different. So these are different species. Okay, why to use endohedral fullerenes? Because, well, there are many advantages. The first one is they possess better ab absorption coefficients than, than pristine C60 or C70. So that is a very good improvement. In addition, you, you, can, you have a very good control on the homolumo level, simply because you can modify the species incarcerated in the, in the carbon cage. And also, uh, uh, well, this is what I mentioned, and these findings could impact the photoinduced electron transfer processes as, as actually it is. So, um, now the, the, here you can see some examples, what I'm telling you. Here is the, the C60, C70, which is the, the oxidation potential, the reduction potential, so are quite, quite, quite similar. So when you change C60 by C60 by C70, you are slightly modifying the electronic properties. But look at this, just by using endohedral fullerenes, you are dramatically modifying the electronic properties. Actually, look at this, it's a very, very powerful electron donor, uh, electron donor species. This is a very, very powerful electron acceptor species. So you are controlling and modifying, modifying at will the, the, the energy gap. And this is an important matter. Actually, we reported the first example, it was a few years ago, in collaboration in a, in a joint project with uh, Tomas Torres, Luis Echegoyen, and Dirk Guldi, who carry out the photophysical experiments. But uh, we carry out the, uh, the covalent connectivity of electron donor molecule like ferrocene to uh, lanthanum, uh, um, sorry, uh, the scandium nitride and the hydral fullerene. And well, the first uh, problem was just to identify the compound because you have now uh, the, possible, the, the possibility of two different isomers, the 5, 6, and 6, 6. So eventually by electrochemical uh, means we were able to, to determine which was the right, uh, uh, the right isomer. But the ones we have here, what is much more remarkable is that light irradiation promotes the electron transfer from the donor to the acceptor. How efficiently? Well, if we compare with the pristine C60, then what is remarkable is the transient absorption measurements reveal that the radical ion pair was formed here with a lifetime three times higher than pristine C60. So in principle, this, this system could be quite appealing for photovoltaic approach. And this was reported in, in 2008, and just one uh, year later, uh, in 2009, it was reported, uh, it was here in February 2009, it was reported the first example having this lutetium nitride, which is the, the analogous or PCBM, no, no M, this is another ester group, but uh, in this case it was the efficiency was close to 5% and a little bit higher, a little bit better than that of for pristine C60. So that this means this means that, uh, that's, that these materials are very, very appropriate also for photovoltaic purposes. Still, the main problem is the, the scarce uh, amount available for these materials. So, since then, we have carried out another beautiful studies. I will only mention four papers in one slide. Uh, it's possible to include other electron donors. This is with lanthanum C82. This is an uh, electron acceptor, and here light irradiation promotes electron from the donor to the fluorine. But if you put a powerful electron acceptor, it, it, it happened in the other way around. Light irradiation promotes one electron from the fluorine acting as a donor to the electron acceptor species. And we have carried out basically the same involving carbon nanotubes. This has been another paper reported very recently, but mostly involving these molecular tweezers, which are soluble in water media, and uh, yes, electron transfer. So here the carbon nano, single wall carbon nanotube acting as an acceptor, but also as a, as a donor. So these are, yeah, I have only two slides for finishing. One is this one, which is what about carbon nanotubes? Carbon nanotubes is uh, it's a pen on the neck. It's, uh, it's really uh, are difficult to use uh, for these purposes. In principle, you can consider that they are of interest for the, for the uh, active uh, layer or to be used, as you can see here, uh, just to favor the, 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 the charge transport to the electrodes. These are the two possibilities. But in, in any case, look at this was, of course, that there are many, it was a long time since then, 
but uh, well, those papers dealing with the using carbon nanotubes in the active layer, in general, the efficiency is very, very poor. There are many reasons for that, but uh, to date, as is mentioned here, bulk heterojunction devices have demonstrated relatively poor efficiencies. There are many reasons for that. Probably may, the, here you can find about that, but probably because still there is no uh, a, a very good me procedure method to prepare pure single wall carbon nanotubes. I mean, it is not that you, when you get carbon nanotubes, you have different diameters, different length, different helicity, different electronic behavior, metallic versus semiconductive, and so on. So when you have metallic carbon nanotubes, consider that the length of the carbon nanotubes is roughly the same to that of the active layer. That means that you get a short circuit, uh, 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 and therefore uh, there is not efficiency for that. So I would like to finish with this. These are, um, these are the, the evolution of the uh, organic uh, photovoltaics, and you can see that now we are close to 12%, as Emilio mentioned, close to commercialization. Uh, but uh, I have to say that since the very beginning, when I was working in the project, the former project in Europe on this, 5%, I hear that when we reach 5%, commercialization will become a reality. Now it was set 10, and now we are approaching to 15. So we are in the process, we are in the way. So this is uh, uh, two years ago, we published this uh, special issue with carbon nanotubes. This was a mistake of the journal, carbon nanos, nanostructures for energy. It was focused on that. We have been, during the last almost four years, working and funded by the Mad uh, Madrid government, uh, Madrid Solar. These are the groups have been involved in this one. This is the new institute in there where we are planning to, to develop uh, organic photovoltaics as well. And uh, uh, this is the group. Uh, I would like to thanks to those people who have been mostly engaged with that. Uh, we have to mention the European Commission because we have been participating in several European projects in addition to the most recent advanced grant, Alexander von Humboldt, of course the, the regional government and, and, and the, the Spanish ministry has been also always supporting very strongly. And, and uh, thank you to all of you for your kind attention.